Pliny himself is quite a mathematician. I mentioned in a previous uh, uh, session that uh, Fritz Stoll, the eminent Sanskritist, uh, Dutch Sanskritist, uh, went so far as to describe Anani as the Indian Euclid. And this is because of this text, the Ashtajayi. When I first started studying Sanskrit, I assumed that studying Sanskrit would, would be like um, studying uh, German or Spanish or, or, or Russian. But uh, this, this changed very, very quickly. And I realized, in fact, it, it didn't seem to me I was even studying a language. It became apparent to me from the very beginning that I was studying some sort of system. In fact, almost, I guess you would call it a system of logic. And this is the conclusion that the uh, modern Westerners have come to uh, about Panini's Ashtajayi, that in fact it is one of the, if not the, most sophisticated system of logic known. So, let's get into a little bit about what the Ashtajayi actually is. We can think of the Ashtajayi as being composed of four major things. We have the phonetics, the phonemes. Um, we've gone over the phonemes of, uh, of Panini from the Ashtajayi. This is the uh, Shiva Sutra or the Maheshwara Sutras that, um, that we went over on the, the Mahashivaratri uh, session. Fourteen short sutras that contain within them the 50 syllables uh, or phonemes of what we can think of as the Sanskrit language. Ayun Rik, Ayun Eoch, Hayavarat Ran, Nyamanananam, Jabang, Gadadash, Jabagadadash, Kapachatata Chatatao, Kapai Shasasar. From those articulations, from those 14 short lines, from those 50 phonemes, Hanani was able to generate an entire language, and not a finite language, a language that goes on and on and on and encompasses all speech. From 14 short lines. So what starts to become interesting is, and, and this is fascinating, of course, to our modern mathematicians of the last 150 years, is how is he able to generate so much out of so little, out of relatively so little. How long did it take me to, to, to recite those, uh, those 14 sutras? A minute? Two minutes? 90 seconds? And we can generate thousands of years of, of speech out of that? That leads us into the next part of the Ashtajaya, which is the rules, that there are, how many? 3,959, I believe, sutras, or rules, that provide the way that these phonemes, 
these these uh, uh, syllables can be combined and uh, uh, changed and put together and so forth to represent the entire world. If we are comfortable with the fact that it's our speech or our language that is behind our thinking, our perception, and our experience, and there are many that subscribe to that, I would say including Noam Chomsky, um, if we subscribe to that, then we can see that these 3,959 uh, 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 rules, sutras of Panini, are capable of generating this entire existence. Now, after, now I'm going to get back to the rules because we really have to discuss how interesting these rules actually are. In addition, after we have the, uh, the rules, then we have um, some, uh, I guess what you would call uh, morphology. We have the, um, we have uh, 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 nominal roots. That means we have uh, 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 roots of words that are nominal, that become nouns and we have the much more important verbal roots, which not only become verbs, but become nouns and every other part of speech. There are those ancient grammarians that um, argued about the existence of nominal roots um, to, uh, uh, and, and felt that it was only the verbal roots that had a, uh, an actual uh, manifestation and that, um, that nominal roots uh, really resided within their verbal roots. But that's, um, that's, another, that's another evening, <laughs> another story. Okay, so Panini is Talking about both phonemes. Excuse me. Father. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry for the interruption. No, but that's fine. Um, help me understand morphology as you were describing. Okay. It. If, okay. I was if just the gonna... sounds are phonetics and the rules are syntax, what is it that corresponds to sounds and rules? Okay. We have phonemes and we have morphemes. A phoneme is the basic unit of speech uh, in terms of an articulation, a syllable. A phoneme is a syllable. A morpheme, on the other hand, is the smallest reducible unit of meaning. Are you with me? So when yes, uh, you can you can say that words are composed of a minimum of one morpheme. You can have multi-syllable words, but for example, you can have uh, the the word um, lady, and lady is lay di two syllables, but lady, uh, you can say ladylike. Uh, lady of ladylike is one morpheme, and like is the second morpheme, All right? So it's a basic, fundamental unit of meaning. And this is going to come out of the, uh, what they call the datupat. The, the, the roots of nouns and the roots of verbs.
Does that does that answer you, Kailash? Yes, it's very fine. Okay. A minimal, meaningful unit of language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could you could say that. Okay. Let's go back to these rules because this is really where it it becomes quite astounding. We start out with this word pratyahar, and we, in previous uh, uh, sessions and in, in discussions, we've played around a little bit with this word pratyahar or pratyahara. Normally, this is translated by people who see Patanjali as speculative as meaning the withdrawal of the senses from their sense objects. But in the tradition of speech and in the grammatical tradition of Patanjali, Pratyahar is something a little bit different. We've discussed in the past the general Pratyahar, which is the word Aham. Why is this Aham, which seems to mean I, first person singular, uh, why is this a almost a description of pratyahara because this a uh, which is the first of all syllables and this ha which we can think of as the final syllable the last of all syllables are joined together and identified with this anuswar m so that to Panini and to Patanjali, this word aham means more than the first singular, first person singular, that when used in the sense of application, this word means the beginning and the end and everything in between. How is the beginning how does the beginning reach the end and how does the end return to the beginning? This is through the manifestation of the syllables. The manifestation that is according to the 3,959 rules, sutras, upon any. The arrangement of the Maheshwar Sutras, which I just recited for you, of these 14 sutras, these are not done in an intuitive sense. They are not done in a, even a mnemonic sense, mnemonic meaning a device that is conducive for memory so that you can remember something. Rather, this is done in an arrangement where the final member, the final syllable, the final stop on each one of these 14 sutras is an indicator of something rather than a syllable that uh, is a word. Now, for those who are familiar with anything about computer programming or computer code, something immediately pops up because we find a similar kind of thing in computer code that there are uh, words which give instruction. There are words which become displayed 
and then there are words, letters, and symbols that imply an application. And this is what is happening with the last sound on each one of these 14 sutras, the Maheshwar sutras. When you speak of one of these sutras, one of these 14, and you identify it by the first syllable and the ending indication, these are formally called pratyahars, pratyaharas. What Panani is now going to do with his rules is he can take these syllables and he doesn't have to refer to a particular syllable or even a group of syllables, but rather he can invoke one of the pratyaharas. So if, um, if, if, uh, if he wants to say all the syllables, he says aham. And we know that what he's talking about is etc etc and so forth until we reach ha. When we consider that these are all the possibilities of sounds and that according to the arrangement of these possibilities of sounds this determines our entire universe, it becomes interesting speculatively, philosophically, that the meaning of aham being I also means the entire universe. But this is where we will go when we reach Bhartrihari and Abhinavagupta. These are those commentators that will start identifying these very magical and esoteric qualities of uh, of the speech that is described by Hanuman.